uh, there. It was a great start. And now we will go back into a more deep research. APIA Days is also about like uh, helping big managers uh, and, and, and tech leaders to understand concepts. So we will have, uh, for that, we will have on stage um, Will Venters, professor at London School of Economics, who will tell us about his vision and research about interfaces from a strategic and management perspective. Hello, Will. How are you? Hello. Hi. It's nice to be here. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Nice to uh, have you too. Uh, I invite you to share your slides. We love to invite researchers who have who think really forward about the topic and get these insights that some managers will only get in five or ten years. So please put us in the future. Thank you to be there. Thank you. Um, thank you. Firstly, I apologize. I've got a terrible cold, so uh, that I'm suffering from that. But it was interesting to hear Nigel just talking a moment ago about skills and about how you frame this issue around uh, API growth for um, for strategic people. So the, the CEO level, or CXO level board and try to make sense of that. Um, there's a, OK. Um, and what I want to say is, essentially, I'm going to talk about some research which is being done by a team of researchers here. So myself and uh, Rosaire, um, uh, Erica and Enrico at the London School of Economics. And we'll talk about what they're doing. So let me just pass on. Um, so uh, first of all, um, we've got a long history of researching in cloud computing. Um, we've been uh, following sort of clouds, then the transition to cloud services since uh, before it was called cloud. So I researched um, uh, the, the development of grid computing um, in CERN and uh, early issues on cloud and have kind of defined that uh, uh, and worked within that in the research domain for a very long period of time. Um, and what this research has led us to look at is a, a new research project last few years examining interfaces. So we're part of the LSE is a kind of large part of a large grant um, with Queen Mary, UCL and Imperial computer science departments. And we're the information systems and managerial uh, focused people looking at how we understand interfaces. And we've got a large number of industry partners on the right uh, here. And I'm going to be talking about some early issues that have come out of that research and try to give you a flavor of some of the themes. It's going to be a very much a cherry picking of, of ideas. So please feel free to reach out if anything particularly interests you in this. But I just want to sort of run through a load of our research and try to give you an, an idea of why we need to rethink the way that we approach um, the strategic design of, of APIs. And in part, I'm going to do that because it seems to us that many of the companies resemble a, a sort of first digital camera in their API usage, either developing and offering APIs or in using APIs from outside, in which innovation is led by the technical experts. You know, this is the first digital camera. It's actually created by the company Kodak that you'll remember kind of it demised was because of the digital camera. And there's lots written around that. But I thought it's a really nice metaphor here because the technical experts developed it. It evolved out of the technical lamps as a prototype. It was created by hacking together readily available parts, not necessarily the best parts. There's a, uh, various components there, like the cassette recorder you would recognize, um, and a larger lens at the front. It's messy. It wasn't particularly rigorously tested. And it particularly, it wasn't supported by a business strategy at the CXO level. And therefore, what I think happened was that um, there's uh, literature talking about this, that it wasn't it was poorly aligned with the business strategy. So while Kodak invented the first digital camera, were the first to put a digital camera in space, were heavily involved in the initial designs of digital cameras. Um, they really didn't align it with business strategy. And my worry is that API strategy for some businesses is the same, both using and providing APIs. So what I want to do today is, first of all, argue that all technology was new at some point and then eventually becomes embedded. Uh, this uh, sign for Edison Electric Light kind of nicely reminds us that at some point it was all new. And I want to argue that APIs are strategic of strategic importance, and I'm going to show you how they can shape industries or be seen as kind of an understanding of, of how they align and shape industries. Um, uh, to understand them, we need to think in terms of flow. So we need to work in terms of the flow. And then configuration work um, is needed. So we require to shape this 
flow within and between organizations within the organ um, within the ecosystem okay so I want to give you the idea of uh, the digital economy as being like the Aspen forest. So we see this image here. I'm sorry, by the way, you're seeing the slides with a, in a box. It's because I have such a ginormous screen. I can't share the full screen. So people are complaining on the, the chat. I, I, I can't do anything about that. Um, but this is the Aspen forest. And what it looks like is a load of separate trees. And it's essentially there um, look that while they look like a separate set of trees, an aspen forest is actually a single plant. It's a single colonial organism. And our digital economy is increasingly becoming like this, where we still see it in terms of trees and we think in terms of brands and we t think in terms of how things are working. But ultimately, it's not a set of separate trees. It's rather this interweaved web of root systems underneath. I and mean, with the aspen forest, it's this single organism of these embedded roots that you don't see under the ground. And Brian Arthur talked about this as being the second economy. And APIs, they what we're going to show you, and I'm, this is a piece of research uh, led by my team, is if we look at the way that the API has grown, we start to see it like that, becoming like that aspen forest. And we've increasingly focused on platforms as the focal actor in our analysis of, of the digital economy. So we talk about, and people in their talks have been talking about the kind of Googles and Facebooks and Amazon, et cetera. These huge platform actors that are written about by people like uh, Jeffrey Parker um, and um, Annabel Gower in these books around platforms. Um, and it's true that they started that that uh, that focal actors are still very dominant and that they provide a large number of APIs and are used in that way. But it, it leads us to see trees instead of the underlying root systems. So what we've done is we've traced 25 years of the growth of APIs in the travel industry. So we start in 2001 and this little diagram on the bottom right is the use of API connections within the travel industry sort of between 2001 and 2009. And you had content distribution partners, you had a channel manager and a booking engine, essentially, and then you had hotel distribution companies, and then you had things like Kayak and MetaSearcher to find them. And they offered very few APIs. They were much more kind of separate businesses, the kind of trees that we see there. 2010 to 2014, we start to see the growth of APIs, and we start to see the growth of the inweaving of this ecosystem and this building of an ecosystem such that while you can see dominant players booking Expedia and TripAdvisor and while economically booking and Expedia become very dominant uh, in terms of the, um, the, the the kind of revenue streams in the industry since 2014 we've just seen an explosion in the mus multiplicity of, uh, of APIs and webs and I'm sorry this is a relatively low um, resolution image. I, I don't want to show you, share you. It's such a high, re, a very high resolution image of this because it shows an awful lot of data. But what it does is it gives you an idea of the, the underlying webs of connections that are emerging within this, whereby accessing TripAdvisor in those seconds that you're uh, looking at a page might involve connections with huge numbers of hidden underlying technologies that are coming together to provide service. And in the previous talk, we heard about banking being provided through these agents. And we're seeing in the travel industry the growth of this spreading out of these different agents um, involved in the delivery of that. So we're seeing the shaping of the industry. We're seeing the way that the APIs are coming together and creating new forms of industry, where, which are often hidden from view and not as visible, but a significant part of for instance, calculating the price of a room, which might involve five, 10 different API calls across different companies just to calculate the optimal pricing that's being put on the screen. So how do we understand this? So given that complexity for a strategizer, for someone at CXO level, what do they think about? And we would argue that from a strategic perspective, companies need to understand flow. And flow is derived from the, we're using this term to kind of connect with and, and address what we often call the red queen problem. 
And the red queen problem comes from evolutionary biology. It actually draws from Alice through the looking glass in which she meets the red queen in Lewis Carroll's famous children's story. And he, she meets this red queen in the chess game that she's part of and playing. And the red queen says to her, now look here, you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. And in evolutionary biology, we talk about the fact that species must constantly adapt in order to, and evolve and to and proliferate in order to survive when it's pitted against ever evolving opposing species. And if you take our diagram of the travel industry, each of those elements in that are not a separate platform, but are just part of a evolving ongoing change. And they must constantly adapt what they're doing in order to respond to that. So thinking of APIs as a project misses the fact that they are part of an ongoing and ever present flow. And we need to think about this concept of flow to move us from thinking about things, projects, you know, we're going to do APIs and once it's done, we'll close the project to, to thinking about a process. And we seek three in our analysis, we three see three forms of flow. There's a flow of the marketplace that underlies it. That's the flow of the kind of overall ecosystem, the flow of the change in the area that you are. And within that, you can see a flow of technology. If you think about the fact that the iPhone was only 2007. So in the last 14 years, we've gone from not having smartphones to having these supercomputers we have in our pockets. But that's just one form of technology. We talked, Nigel talked before about the growth of API, of um, AWS and cloud computing, which has created this huge flow of technology. Now it's providing machine learning and TensorFlow as a, through services. We're seeing this kind of growth of these new technologies, but not, not saying, hey, now let's do AI, but seeing AI as part of the flow of technology that's ongoing. But within that, we see a flow of personnel, a flow of people coming into businesses and going out of businesses and strategizing around the flow of people rather than being annoyed when people come leave a company, but actually thinking about how do we get the flow of ideas coming through our company? And then in particular, the flow of business models and strategy. And this is hard, this is not easy to do. So how do we do it? Well, we need something we're gonna call configuration work to shape the flow within and between organizations in that ecosystem of ideas. So looking at um, we, some work we actually did in Huawei, with, with Huawei and Shenzhen, we looked at the three tiers of strategy associated with uh, innovation arrangements. We looked at tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one's the close innovation, the stuff where executives get together and play golf and meet, and you can start, kind of see long-term strategic relationships. So a car company with its retailers might have a close relationship where they can actually get together and talk and agree long-term contracts. You then see tier two near innovation where you can build flexible networks. You can connect with people, but digital supports the, the creation of those collaboration agreements. But still, they're partners. There's probably contractual relationships that are well defined for doing that. That's the near innovation. And they use global communication systems and tools to manage that connection. And then distant innovation work. That's the software development kit and the APIs that we're used to, the open APIs. The first closed APIs are used in tier one and clear tier two, but open public APIs are where you allow other people to innovate at a distance. And all you're de defining then are the tools and the rules. So you're looking for, so if you think about Apple, Apple supports large amounts of distant innovation on its iPhone iOS platform by providing the rules of how to get on the app store, how to install your software onto the um, an iPhone, and the tools to allow the software development kit to allow you to develop an app. But Apple do not get into close meetings and have play golf with everyone producing a game or a little widget on the Apple iStore. They're distant innovation that supports their platform. Remembering that all these innovations happen on top. So what we say is, if you're gonna do close innovation, then you need to think about like eternal APIs within your organization or within tightly controlled partners, you better think about reducing complexity, increasing agility. You better think about new local standards and how you share knowledge with those partners so that you can dynamically change the API to support both sides of the business and help them. And you better focus on loose coupling and tight cohesion within an overall architectural design. 
Um, so you might better think about the design rules associated with that that support both sides because you can open that conversation and you can design these APIs for both sides of it. For near innovation, i.e. partner APIs, you can facilitate communication and integration of them. So think about the way Netflix integrates with um, various television companies. You know that they're going to meet them, they're going to talk, but they're going to be a little bit more distant. It requires tight collaboration agreements and formal documentation and contracts. For the skills, it requires a business with security, documentation and support skills because you might be supporting a large number of people using your innovation, but all of them are partners. They've signed up to something. For distant innovation, where you open the API or open the data and give anyone a free access, you need to think about licensing and contracting, and you need to be tight on the licensing. And you need to have enable and control uh, the interaction between companies. And in particular, what you need to do is make sure that it's static enough that people can start to innovate, but that you can change it to reflect the flow of the marketplace. So there's a real dynamic paradox between locking it down so that people can innovate and know that their innovation will stay fixed and changing it in order to meet the needs of the changing dynamic market base. And one key issue here is focusing on open standards. So that's what you do if you're going to use API strategically and how you focus on it in terms of those three tiers. What does this actually mean for a business? It means that the business, and this is a, a book I wrote actually nearly 10 years ago, about moving to the cloud corporation, it means that your business becomes much more like a flow of, excuse me, that's for unprofessional me, my phone being switched on. Um, it means that your business is very much uh, like a cloud in itself. It's merging the edges of your business. You're connecting with other parties. You're merging parts of your business rather than seeing the cloud as being the data centers, which are actually not cloud-like at all. It's that you're business is becoming more like a cloud, more amorphous, more merged, more connected together. And that has significant issues because software is so malleable. You can change things so easily. And often APIs are left to the developer to lead and to develop. But we know that software can have huge consequences on business. So how do you get the CXO level insight down there in the design of APIs, which can have a huge impact on the business? How do you make sure that the changes to an API, which are highly malleable, it's only a few lines of code to change, which can have a huge impact on the bottom line of a business, are taken strategically seriously. Um, and I like to kind of remind everyone of Volkswagen and what happened to them, that it, like software, because it's so malleable, it's so easy for people to make changes. And this needs skills. And yet the problem at board level, as Peter Vile over at MIT Scissor did, um, with some research on um, last year, well, this year, actually, um, there's very little skills at board level in doing this. If you they have this index of digital savviness. And if you look at um, most large companies and C-suites, um, which they did, um, you'll see that actually even the CTO and CIO are deemed not to have a huge amount of digital savviness. But by the time you get down to the CEO, their rating is kind of 23 percent, a very low level of actual savviness of what the business is. If you think about Nigel's talk. Last, where he said, you know, we're not, we, we need to think about it in terms of strategically, what do we deliver to the customer? Um, lots of C-suites are still talking about service and digital as though it's this, this huge chat, uh, thing separate. They're putting a CTO on the board and allowing them to deal with it or a CDO. And this goes all the way down. So some research I did in 20, 2017 um, looked at expertise in cloud, and we were looking at a huge skills gap even then in the, the amount of cloud skills. And I can only imagine that's gone up since. And also, these people have to manage the legacy. The idea that we can get rid of all of the business uh, is nonsensical. So what you're ending up doing is building API strategies for the outside, but also having to increasingly carry along, particularly for elderly businesses, a legacy environment that needs managing as well. And how you integrate those into these sort of cloud strategy and API strategies really needs thinking about. So ultimately, it's like drive, fighting a, uh, flying a fighter plane. You need to think about the movement you're having through space and time as you flow through the air. You need to think about the flow of other parties in the, in the space, like these other fighter planes alongside this one. You need to look at all the dials and produce, make sure that those dials reflect what you need to look at in order to keep flying. And you need what we've also called situational awareness, which is that sense of 
looking into the future and imagining the flow that you're happening having to ha get there. So just to conclude, finally, executives, we think, should focus on flow, not events or products or projects. Focus on technology skills and strategies in weaved and connected together. Think about the unintended consequences of this stuff, and particularly around risk and security. Focus on skills portfolios right the way up to the C-suite. And then develop this deep situational awareness, particularly on the direction of the industry and how their part in the industry is now increasingly a part of a root system of the Aspen forest rather than a, um, a the, an individual tree, as it were. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Very much, Will. Uh, thank you for this uh, great presentation. We have some question about like the orchestration, you know, the uh, the theory of the firm. I know it can, can, can be controversial in economics sometimes, but at the end, does APIs just lower the transaction costs of people interacting with each other in the digital manner, like, you know, the digital software supply chain or, you know, uh, uh, like this in the as a service economy. And so because of that, they can completely conquer, uh, let's say, industries where this transaction cost to interact with each other digitally were, were high. At the end, is this just that or it's something more than that? It, so it's very easy to frame these arguments in terms of transaction costs, and there's an awful lot of economic work that does a, uh, that, that looks at that. The, the, the question, in a sense, is uh, firstly that sort of the understanding of what those transaction costs is often limited. That actually, what what are you costing here? Particularly that transaction costs are calculated at that moment. It's like it's I can look at the balance sheet and work out what are the costs today. But if you're part of a flow of change, so if you're not far, part of, actually, I'm not worrying about today, I'm worrying about two years down the line when all my competitors have implemented AI, which I have no idea what it's going to cost me. I have no idea what it's going to cost them. I have no idea how that transaction is going to work it, when we build AI in the future. Then understanding the transaction cost today is slightly problematic. So in these dynamic industries and in this tight sense of, of flow, it, it can get, it can get, it can be easy to focus and think in a transaction cost theory way, and it can be very useful. I'm not criticizing it, but it does sort of deny the fact that we're in a massively changing industry. And in particular, if you look at a lot of industry that's based around um, platform business, it's around their expectation of growing markets rather than actual reduction in transaction costs today. It's like nobody's worrying about particularly what the transaction cost of an Uber uh, cab is, as long as it's growing market share and becoming the dominant platform in that space. So that <clears throat> the platform economics argument kind of alongside the transaction cost argument is a really interesting interesting debate. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to leave my phone on. No, no um, problem. Yeah. But the tra in the transaction cost, when people claim it's not just a pure transaction cost, it's also no. the cost of you know uh, time to market, not to wait nine months to integrate with a value proposition in your application. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not only the transaction cost in this pure transaction, but it's also about how to transact, how to negotiate, how to partner and saving one year on a value, delivering a value proposition is lowering at some point this transaction cost and at least giving return on investment faster. But but that's I, I completely agree, but it's a framing of an understanding of what yeah. you're trying to do. It's not as though you can calculate those transaction costs uh, yeah. precisely and therefore make strategic economic decisions on the basis of it in these type of industries. That's yeah. a kind of, I think that's a very much harder to do i mean it's not my area let's be also very very clear i'm um i mean information systems and management rather than an economics but um it, it i do think that, that we can overblow somehow the the transaction cost uh, arguments here um a little bit because it, it's it's a lens to look at the world you know i've got a i've got a lens here there's a wide angle lens on my little camera here i could put a different lens on and look at the world in a different way and I think people see it as though you have one lens to look at the world, whereas actually start thinking about there are multiple lenses. And if you want to kind of make real sense of the world, you need a wide angle, you need a, a telephoto, you need a lot of different lenses to analyze your business model. And I think that's a kind of key part of it here so that you can kind of bring things into focus and, and take them out of focus. And transaction cost is a very useful one. But it's One last question too. about uh, uh, maybe, you know, the paper about Martian van Aslin, uh, the impact of API and performance, uh, where he shows that uh, uh, actually companies who have full strong API strategies on their IT systems, information systems, are, are have actually a higher valuation on the stock market because people 
see them as platforms. You know, they, they anticipate they will be platforms tomorrow. My question here is, is it because you have APIs that you become a platform more easily and attract people uh, to onboard on your, uh, with you on your value proposition? Or is it because you have a great value proposition that to fulfill your growth, you are obliged to finally adopt interfaces that are agile like APIs? I think it's the latter. So I thought it was great. You know, I came in the last and listened to some of Nigel's the talk before and it, his intense focus on the value proposition I thought was very refreshing. I think it is that value proposition that, that's the key part. And then what happens, I think, is that it, the realization that the best way to provide the value proposition is by partnering with a large number of other players. And that's when the platform strategy comes in. So um, the success of, you know, the success of the iPhone initially was it was a great value proposition. We liked the sexy phone. We liked doing this on our phone rather than just jabbing it. But then as the marketplace opened, it became the platform. And then the value exploded with the apps. But it wasn't that you can start screaming, I'm going to be an app. At the, I'm going to be a platform at the start without that value proposition that draws users to it. Because you have the you have this kind of classic chicken and egg problem of platforms. Is You need a large number of users in order to attract developers. These are two-sided markets. So APIs uh, development is only attractive because there's a large number of users. So once iPhones had a large number of users, suddenly people were interested in developing commercially apps to go on top of that platform. Um, so you always have this issue of, of how do you do that? Now, it is a chicken and egg problem because you could develop a large number of service providers who then help you with a much better value proposition, which allow, attract a large number of customers or you could start with a large number of customers and use that to attract a large number of developers to add value to your platform. But ni neither is an easy strategy. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of this has actually just been about how do you sell the market to gain the runway of investment to make sure that you do it. So the biggest battle is much more about investment so that you can fund one side of the market over the other to, to try to drive platform growth. But that, that I mean, Jeffrey Parker's book, and his work and the kind of large amount of research in platform um, economics it tells us all of that. Yeah, thank you very much, Will. Uh, we, we reached the time, but it was really great insights and we'd love to invite you in on other conferences to continue the discussion. It was a great setting up the stage for the whole day. Uh, thank you, it's been a concept. Thank you very much, Will. Looking forward uh, having you again.